So in this talk, we're going to be talking about uh, winter vegetable production. And uh, I'm going to talk a lot about low tunnel usage because that's what we use primarily. Well, I'll get into some high tunnel uh, talk as well. And winter vegetable production it goes much better if you have taken care of soil quality issues in a big way because you're, you're actually asking something even greater from the earth in terms of it's being able to produce for you abundantly in a very uh, cold or off season period than what you would normally be exposing your vegetables to. So it's even more important that you take uh, proper care of your soils in order to get abundant crop growth going in the fall and winter time too. So, you know, we grow three acres of vegetables. We have probably an acre plus covered in high tunnels and primarily low tunnels. And we've been doing that for, you know, over 20 years. And this vegetable field that grows winter vegetables for us year round has grown vegetables year round for 25 years or longer. Uh, and so we've asked a lot of this field and I would just point out that this field was incredibly disturbed and in very poor condition when we initially got onto the field and we have enriched the field through our agricultural practices and had year round abundant crop growth all at the same time. So those things have gone hand in hand. And so we've been able to bring the, the soil into a high level of functioning while it's been in constant uh, crop production. Now, some of the reasons we initially got into low tunnels to this extent is the affordability of them and the fact that uh, it didn't leave structures in our way. So those materials last, the plastics last three years, four years, or five years. The hoops actually last, you know, almost indefinitely. And so you're looking at, if you, if you move that out over, say, four years, it's like a $2,000, $3,000 investment, you know, between the hoops lasting for a really long time and the plastic lasting, say, four years. Uh, so to cover 42,000 square feet for $3,000 is very economically viable. That is complete coverage. There's no spaces between the hoop tunnels or anything like that. That is just acre fully covered like you see right there. And so uh, that was a very affordable option for us. Now, as I, as I came to learn, uh, as time went on, uh, this system ended up giving us better, much better soil quality than our high tunnel system because we actually were eyeballing at the beginning whether we should just put the field into high tunnels. Uh, however, we kept running into soil quality issues in the high tunnels that we weren't running into in the low tunnel system. And so we started thinking about, well, what exactly is going on with that? And one of the reasons that we have stuck with low tunnels, aside from their affordability and things like that, is that they seem to maintain soil quality much better and perhaps that has to do with a number of factors, which I suspect are these, where these beds are three feet wide and water and snow seeps down in between each of those individual beds because those plastics are cut in between those beds. Uh, and so water and snow penetrates and it only has to wick over a foot and a half in either direction to keep the bed fully hydrated. And so the wicking action of the soil seems to be able to give a constant water uh, balance that is appropriate to keep the soil microbiology functioning. So I suspect that is why they are working well for us. Uh, other factors that seem to be in favor of low tunnels is their ability to interact with the environment much easier. So we uh, these are vented in the picture here and they're being exposed, but there's a double layer perforated cover underneath a solid cover and the ability to uncover the hoops for rain or other atmospheric conditions. In other words, they interface with the atmosphere much more than are more permanently covered 
high tunnels. Even though we take the high tunnel covers off for half a year, uh, these things, you know, they'll be uncovered much more frequently for rainstorms or different uh, events. Aeration uh, is more uh, prevalent in these exposure to the atmosphere. So, in other words, uh, we can under a under a warm period, the solid covers are completely removed, leaving just a perforated cover. So the the, the leaves and crops are very exposed to atmospheric conditions, as opposed to high tunnel culture, which is a little more protected. So those are some of the things we suspect. Maybe it's other factors. I'm not sure. But uh, we've been able to maintain, you know, obviously the crop production that we're getting on utilizing this kind of a system. Okay, so there's some high tunnels that we have in place as well. Hey, and uh, here's setting up some low tunnels. This is, you know, th this whole slideshow has a, is actually from quite a while ago. So this is uh, from setting up in a tilled uh, field situation. These beds were shaped using a bed shaping equipment and uh, so they're raised beds with a mulch laid down in the wheel tracks. Now if some of you have been to the earlier talks there is always a mulch surface over the entire bedded area and wheel tracks at this point and they're much less raised. However let's talk about that for right now. So uh, this field for low tunnels, well Let's get into drainage. So the, uh, our fields are wetter. Our wet period is winter time. And so uh, you need to address drainage issues much more likely than you do for your summer cropping. So, you know, obviously field areas can pool water in the winter that would never pool water in summer production. So for reliable large scale uh, winter vegetable production, you know, you gotta, you gotta put a little extra effort into eyeballing your drainage issues and make sure drainage issues are addressed, whether you're gonna tile drain the field or open ditches on the sides, that kind of thing. You, you wanna make sure your drainage is in place on, on, a, on a large level, because it's obviously a problem in winter vegetable growing. However, on top of that, these beds are all arranged uh, against the slope of the field, but not too much against the slope. So they are, if the slope is perfectly this way, they're probably at like a 10 degree angle, maybe 20, 15, somewhere in there, so that water, would, which would normally move across the field this way, will hit, not be able to move across the field this way, but will not just sit there in those wheel tracks either. Will, if it pools up, it's gonna slowly drain off. So bed arrangement is important, particularly for winter vegetable production, to make sure that the field is in an appropriate drainage situation. Obviously, the raised bed nature of doing this helps with drainage. And uh, although our beds are not nearly as raised as they, as they used to be, under the new no-till system and the improved soil por porosity, uh, our drainage issues are are significantly less under, under a non-tilled soil. So we have success using the new system with less raised beds. However, under our tillage system, we used to raise our beds to get uh, them to drain even better and to raise them up to heat them better. Because when you start raising earth out of the earth, it, uh, it allows it to warm uh, better. So. Raising beds, you know, is a useful technique for winter vegetable production. I should also mention that uh, part of the success of this is also the high level of microbial activity in the soil. The soils are so biologically alive, they generate their own heat. So the more functioning the biological system of the soil is, the more it generates its own heat and the more it can uh, affect the heat inside of your low tunnel environment. Obviously also your carbon dioxide interchange with the air as the microbes exhale the carbon dioxide into the hoop tunnels as well for growth. So, all right, so there it is bedded and the mulch was previously laid in the wheel tracks to avoid covers freezing to the bare earth. So, as I said now, the whole surface of the field is under a mulch layer, but in, th in these days, under a tillage system, we specifically put mulch down to avoid excessive freezing of the covers to the ground. 
and then now you see the way the hoops are getting laid out. Uh, hoop layout can go very quickly. I will discuss hoop dynamics in a minute, but let's just talk about layout because that's what this picture is about. So the first thing we do, well, first of all, the field is completely standardized to either all these beds are either 80 feet long or 120 feet long. <coughs> and that is because all the covers are cut to 50 foot lengths so that they cover a 40 foot bed. So obviously 120 foot length bed is, is divided into three sections. Uh, 40 foot to a section, 50 foot cover. So every bed has, they're all the same covers. Everything's standard, so all covers are cut. So that you don't have to mess around with that. So standard bed, uh, width and length. And then the beds are narrow, 36 inches wide. These are worked with Cub tractors uh, because narrower beds resist snow load better. So uh, that is also why the beds are that narrow. The first thing we do is lay down the bags because to move bags onto a field that has wires in it is painful. <laughs> so first thing you do, you get out there and you, and you put all your bags down on the field. And that is five bags on each side of a 40 foot bed. And what are in the bag? sand or subsoil. Sand or subsoil. So that can all happen pretty quickly. The bags are kept off the side of the field and then moved onto the field. We like to put them under trees and other uh, shady spots in the summertime. And we have a cub tractor with a dump cart that you can load the bags on and bring it out over the field and toss them about. And certainly we do use that, but often we'll just wheelbarrow them out or uh, whatever is handy at the time. And then we set the hoops. And it is faster for two people to set hoops if they know what they're doing. It goes very quickly. Uh, one person is holding the hoops and pulling them out. The other person sets it on the opposite bed side. And then once it's set over there, this person jabs that one in, takes a couple steps backward, toss the hoop out to the other person, and so it happens all very quickly. No black plastic. Uh, we have darkened the soil through a number of means, and a darkened soil certainly collects more solar uh, energy. So just by the organic matter additions, the compost and, and functioning soil biology has dramatically darkened the soil over the years. It was a fine sandy loam. Some of it looked like a beach when we first started. And uh, it has now progressed into a very darkened nature. We have artificially darkened the soil surface with uh, charcoal or uh, bone char or uh, humates. Uh, none of them seem to give us any greater growth than just the regular darkened soil, but it, ha it has been approach, an approach that was taking place in the past. Obviously, this culture is extremely similar to French intensive market gardening, the use of cold frames and uh, the bell-shaped cloches there. Uh, very similar in a lot of regards uh, to that kind of culture. So we've taken a lot of techniques from French intensive market gardening is really what this has a lot to do with. It's a little bit more modern materials using, using the polyethylene film instead of glass, but really similar uh, techniques. So this is getting into plastics, but I'm not really done with hoop, hoops yet, nor am I really done with high tunnels. But I'm going to keep running with the way the slide show is here because I'm sure we're going to catch up on those two things. So let's talk about the plastics now. Well, the sandbags I'm going to talk about first. Those are 6 mil UV resistant uh, sandbags from rainflow irrigation. And they last for years. Other sandbags, woven ones and all kinds of different, I've never had uh, long lasting sandbags except for these ones. Rainflow irrigation. And so they are very useful 
and we use those extensively for all kinds of things on the farm, but particularly, obviously, in the low tunnel culture. Um, you can see, and I'll talk about, there's a picture later on about the hoops and what sizes we use, so I'm going to wait to talk about them until we get there. But you can see here, this is demonstrating the two-layer nature of what covers we use on the field. So underneath the bottom cover is a perforated, has holes punched in the cover very thoroughly, uh, maybe every two inches, three inches, two to three inches apart. And so that lets a lot of air and atmosphere uh, in and out of the hoop tunnels. And this is an example of venting. Atmosphere is very important for the winter vegetable crops. So we often vent whenever we can, particularly at this time of year when veg veg vegetation growth is starting again. So, and I should probably talk about that time of year and growth. So in Connecticut, our low temperatures usually don't get below negative 10 at this point. You know, some years we won't even get below zero. So that's the kind of region that we're functioning in. We can get heavy snow loads, three, four feet, you know. But generally it's, it's gotten warmer and we're looking at, you know, zero to negative ten most winters. And uh, so we utilize the low tunnels. It's, it's a progression in the fall. So as I said, the field is constantly cropping vegetables. And so what's happening is in the summer, uh, the field obviously has no low tunnels on it. And then as we're moving into fall, uh, usually about like mid-October, uh, and frost is starting to threaten, uh, we start setting low tunnels and or using row covers on top of crops. Now, cloth row covers sometimes will support with hoops and uh, the fall in order to keep the cloth up off a crop that might be sensitive to chafing or something like that, but often the cloth row cover to protect the fall cabbages or to protect the fall beets or something like that is just going directly over the crop just to keep the frost from damaging an already grown crop. So the cloth row covers that we utilize for frost protection are simply to keep the already grown crop from being damaged, essentially. We're not looking to increase their growth rate. We're looking to simply protect them to constantly keep them harvested and moved into market. Uh, if we're looking for growth in the fall, we, we start putting on plastics to, because a plastic will give us a 35 degree heat gain in the sun. So if it's 50 out, it's going to be 85 under the cover. And that is how we will encourage growth of a fall spinach or a fall lettuce or salad greens for fall or a fall late fall radish or something like that. So if we're looking for things to actually grow and get sizing and we're going to utilize the, the plastic covers for heat gain and to keep things moving. The cloth covers are simply to protect the, the crop. The cloth covers by this time of year, by winter, are out of the field because they freeze, obviously, and then you can't get them up off the ground, you can't get them off of each other, and uh, so we seek to have everything harvested and out of the field, uh, no longer protected by cloth row covers, usually by the beginning of December. Uh, you know, there'll be periods in there where the covers will be frozen, they'll freeze to each other, but usually, reliably in our region, the, the cloth covers will at some point thaw out in December and if they're stuck together, we'll be able to get them apart, finish harvesting, and get them put away before they're permanently under a snow load and frozen to the ground till spring or something like that. So uh, yeah, the covers all, uh, generally we dry them. And so what we'll do is if you know it's an emergency situation, we're getting them off the field in December, we'll just roll them up wet and toss them in under a shed or in the greenhouse, hoop tunnel, it's not being utilized or something, spring seedling house. And then under a dry day, maybe the ground's frozen and sunny, no snow or something, we'll roll them back out and dry them and then roll them up and store them in sheds that are rodent proof uh, and out of the sun in order to keep 
so most of them, like I said, are 50 feet. I mean, we have 150 footers for the other fields that we do much wider, just fall vegetable production. So generally, most of them are just 50 feet long, and it's just a matter of, uh, yeah, you're laying them out. You can lay them out in a pile, even they'll dry reasonably, even on top of each other. Uh, you know, they'll dry better individually, but we will stack them up even for drying, and they don't have to be perfectly dry either, because, you know, they're gonna be under a cover for a long time, but just get them dry enough. And then, uh, yeah, we just wind them up uh, by hand. So that usually looks like get a little cluster, and then uh, you can either roll it that away, kind of depending on your technique, or you can just keep sucking it in and rolling it up into a ball, and then we store the balls individually. So along that line, let's talk about laying them out. So then when we've got these rolls, you know, all in our sheds, and we, and we pick them out, and we got them all rolled up, what we do then is, you know, everything's broken into 40 foot lengths. And say we needed to cover these 10 beds. We would unroll 10 row covers at the top of that section right there. And then one person would take a cover and bring it down and we would put a cover on. And that's easier than trying to get in between all these hoops and unroll each one. So we unroll them where we have space and then move them down onto the field to whatever extent. I mean, you don't want to get crazy, but uh, you, know, you, can, you can unroll them on top of hoops if you have to. But uh, generally, we like to unroll them in mass and then move them down onto the field. So it's a progressive movement from the cloth row cover into the plastic covers. And so as we're constantly cropping, uh, essentially the, in the fall, there's less and less cloth covers and more and more replacement with the plastic hoop tunnels as crops are harvested and we go into constant vegetable production through the field. So that is to take advantage of the uh, solar energy that's available. And so although we certainly crop things through the fall and get things up to size uh, for winter harvest, there isn't tremendous amounts of growth that happens in December and January. Uh, that is more a period where we have hopefully got the crops up to a size that we will be able to steadily harvest out of the field during that period of time, as opposed to really trying to increase growth in December and January. They, they do grow, particularly spinach, but it's at a much slower rate. The huge win, obviously, for a system like this is this time of year. The sun is higher in the sky, our temperatures are starting to raise, and all of a sudden, all these crops in the field are absolutely exploding as of like last week. And uh, we're getting a rampant growth. By mid-February, we're starting to market large volumes of leafy greens right out of the field, uh, which will continue straight through till May when some of the spring things start to uh, come in. So we capture a huge segment of the market from February. Not that we weren't selling stuff in the fall and winter too, but abundant, abundant yields starting in mid-February straight through till you know, May plus when other farms are just starting to enter into the market with their, uh, with their production. So that's February to March, April, and May, three solid months ahead. And the customers are voraciously hungry at this time of year, <laughs> you know? The fall, they're still full of root vegetables. Yeah, and you know, they've had a lot of stuff, but now they're really hungry, and they're sick of root vegetables, and they want some fresh things, and so the market is just huge, huge, huge at this time of year, and that's really what we're really going for here when we're hitting this kind of a system. I would just mention things like breeding for cold resistance. So we certainly have taken crops, uh, say just arugula as an example, we've taken uh, arugula in our environment, which was uh, not particularly cold hardy, grown it in the low tunnel system and had a five or 10% survival rate, and then saved the seeds from those five or 10% and had almost a hundred percent survival rate in the very next generation. So you can really, you know, increase by growing the things in your environment. You can certainly 
increase the rate of what can survive in, in your particular environment. Let me just mention snow load in terms of insulation value. Uh, let me see if I have pictures of snow load in here too. I don't want to get too up. Oh, there's, there's storage in the shed, rodent proof, absolutely stuffed full of covers. There's a box too we built to store the covers in. Uh, so we have a lot of covers to store. So snow is both extremely beneficial and of course potentially hazardous. So uh, yeah, okay, they're just blanketed, right? Got several inches of snow right over the top of them. You know, it's not two feet, but you know, it's got whatever, probably a six inch snow, eight inch snow on them or something. Uh, that is perfect. If it's gonna get negative 20, great. Those are so protected. That's a giant insulated blanket over those things. The soil won't even be frozen under those babies. You know, as long as it wasn't frozen before it got a snow load on them. So snow, we intentionally work with snow uh, for our winter crop production in a big way. So if we know there's a cold period coming on, we're gonna leave the blanket of snow on it. And vice versa, uh, if we know we're getting into a sunny period and it's not that cold and we need to get sun on there, we're gonna manually break the top of the snow load off of the cover and allow us to uh, get sun. That's all you really need to do is just break the top because once sun can penetrate the cover, it obviously starts to melt itself off. And then the snow falls into the uh, walk, uh, walkway wheel track, providing insulation and reflective material to focus the sunlight back in on the crop. So snow in general is extremely beneficial because it insulates and uh, keeps the crop even warmer and gives it more light, reflective light, uh, once it's off the surface. Uh, obviously, uh, if you get a heavy snow, uh, it can inhibit light. Uh, detrimentally, so you have to kind of function, uh, you know, do it up according to your, what you think, you know, you got to watch the weather. So here is snow busted off the tops of the covers. I should talk about collapsing uh, of covers. Okay, collapsing has to do with uh, not enough or not strong enough hoops. What we're doing here is a quarter inch thick steel hoop set every two feet and that's good enough for our snow loads and we can get pretty heavy snow loads because it's a wet heavy snow down in Connecticut too often and uh, that generally holds uh, you know we can have little collapses here and there it's usually not a big deal if the spinach gets a little smushed down it might be slightly smushed for a little while but it springs back once the covers back off of it you know if, as, you, as you need more protection or more strength you can go with even more hoops. We go with a solid steel hoop so that you can drive it into the ground, like I was saying, with just two people, instead of if it was a, a pipe, which we, you could use and would have even better uh, snow holding characteristics, uh, becomes more difficult to jam into the ground. So we go with just a plain steel, not galvanized or anything, because some of the galvanized materials are a little toxic to, to plant growth. So we generally just go with plain steel uh, quarter inch steel hoops from uh, uh, like uh, metal working shops. Uh, they're, they're either 12 feet long, cut to six foot, although we, we vastly prefer getting 20 footers cut to six foot eight. So they just uh, either snip them or just cut the whole bundle. You know, we'll have several hundred of them bundled together. They just saw the whole pile or they have giant shears and stuff too to snap them. Uh, six foot eight works great for covering a three foot Bed. So here's some different hoop style. As I said, pipe would hold better, but much more difficult to work with. More expensive, far more expensive. And uh, we, we used to use a 3 16th inch hoop, which I believe is that one there. Uh, but the quarter inch hoop, though they're more expensive, definitely held snow much better. So we've gone into a quarter inch diameter hoop. So the perforated plastic is a specialty product and it comes from the Bois Aggravation in Canada. They're in wow. Quebec. Uh, I haven't ever found an American supplier. I believe the material is manufactured in France. The, the difficulty we have run into with the perforated plastic, I should discuss, is that it, uh, there's many perforations in it. They run it through a roller to perforate it. Sometimes the punches don't fully get rid of the little 
hanging chad. <laughs> and so we have to, uh, we lay it out on the ground and some batches are perfect, often the batches are not perfect. We lay them out on the ground 50 foot long and we go through before we separate them because the chads hang in groups, they punch it through like four or eight plastics at a time and we pluck off manually any of the stupid chads that are hanging off of those things. So a little drawback there, like I said, it's very small in comparison to the potential for crop production here. So it's one of those things you just got to do. We don't want the stupid little chads all over our fields. So we spend the time and remove them. The, the plastics are 33 feet wide. And so luckily uh, that is folded on an eight foot three inch seam. So, and that's what we need to cover a three foot bed. Well is an eight foot cover. So uh, you can take sharp knives and slice down the side seams and have your eight foot pieces. Uh, if you're really talented, we, have, we can take three people and three knives and hold them against the roll as another person pulls the roll and another person holds back the roll and we can slice the whole thing in a, in a constant stream. But that's very challenging. You have to have five people working in coordination with each other. And so that is, uh, sometimes it works like really great and sometimes it's very challenging. And so th that's how we cut those. The solid plastics that we utilize are three mil uh, uh, greenhouse plastics. And those come in 24 inch rolls and there's no seam in sight. They fold them completely willy nilly. Every different one is folded differently. So with the 24 inch rolls, we have to measure uh, what the individual, some, usually the batches that we get are often similar, but you have to measure it out so that you're cutting uh, on an eight foot uh, piece, which usually requires, they're on uh, a bar, on two sawhorses, and usually two people have to be underneath the plastic with the knife held at a certain place as the plastic is being pulled and rolled off, which actually goes very quickly, but again is an acrobatic event. And so that's how we cut the plastics down to eight foot wide. So here is snow between the hoops which is just perfect for holding the covers down and insulating. So obviously winter winds can be a concern and you know, so snow is a great help as is rain to holding down covers. You know, we have a very, there's a pond at the bottom of the field there and we can get a lot of wind across the bottom of the field. So, uh, but this whole upper section has all got a giant uh, per, uh, evergreen windbreak that is very useful for keeping the wind to a minimum. Here is melting snow coming off of the low tunnels. You know, this is close to a perfect environment here. And this is an example of having a tremendous amount of snow and still being able to pull the cover out, harvest the crop that's underneath there, and then smush the cover back down and recover it. So that's what just happened right there. So the plastics, you know, they're slippery. They don't freeze to the soil, especially with the mulch surface on the soil. And you can always slide them out. Sometimes the bag will be frozen to the earth. You gotta kick it or smash it with another sandbag or something. But essentially, we never can't not get in if we absolutely have to. So uh, that is what the scenario looks like. But again, you know, we're not looking at marketing heavily in December and January when we usually get these kinds of snows. And usually by February, you know, that's when we want to start, we want to start marketing. And we've been get, able to get uh, significant crop growth going through that period of time. So here's examples of just going through the field and just knocking the tops off. This was done with snow shovels. We take snow shovels, we round off the corners so that they're not sharp. We make sure it's a very smooth plastic shovel and we just knock the top off with a shovel. We don't use it to shovel snow. It's a special shovel that is kept just for knocking the tops of the hoop tunnels off. Obviously slightly labor intensive, uh, but you know, people are looking for things to do in the winter. <laughs> and they get right out there and so do I. 
And uh, this is obviously profitable, and that's why we put the effort into it. The human effort required to do a little snow knocking off compared to an acre of high value leafy greens brought through to market at a time when there is nothing else on the marketplace is uh, a very uh, lucrative activity to do. So it requires effort, uh, finesse, details, and uh, however, there is ample reward. Uh, it, it not only is valuable in and of itself, but when, you when you're starting to talk about uh, year-round uh, large volume food production for people uh, in accounts, you, there is never a break. We never stop with the restaurant. We never stop with our food co-op. We never stop with our farmer's market customers. They come every single week or day or whatever and they can buy our crops, whether it's the root vegetables and things we bring in in the fall, but it goes right into leafy greens. So there's never, you never lose contact with your produce buyer. You know, you're always in constant contact and it's a stream of sales that is, they're looking for consistency. The customers are looking for consistency and the more consistent you become, the better you secure your market. So that is, it's valuable in a number of manners like that. This is an exciting achievement that uh, we're, we, we, we worked on on the farm. And this is taking sawdust from our local cabinet maker, he's actually a coffin maker, and lighting it on fire. And it's on top of pieces of plywood, you see, and there's snow. This particular year, I think we had several feet of snow on top of our hoop tunnels in February, and it needed to go, because we needed to get underway, and we weren't gonna shovel that all off. We have shoveled large volumes of snow in the past. When we came up with this method a few years ago, it was a huge breakthrough. So this sawdust, which is dry, it's a pine sawdust, we just took a match to and we lit it on fire. It starts to look like this, and we start to churn it around with rakes in order to char the material. And so we, we make a char, uh, I guess you could call it a biochar, but it's really just charred sawdust by stirring in an open fire. <laughs> Our excited winter fella, uh, it's even warm, you know, warm project in the winter, very popular. And we stir this stuff around until it is fully blackened. Uh, obviously, we're doing it on top of plywood so that we can uh, then, you know, it's getting more towards finished now, more fully decomposed. Obviously, it's a little hot, your face gets red, and we have longer rakes as well uh, on poles that we utilize. Uh, this is showing that it started to turn to ash. That's too far. Not that ash isn't useful too, but really we try to keep it in a blackened char state. Ash is the next state. Uh, and so that's just about finished. So the next step is once it's finishing up and the flames are pretty much extinguished once it starts moving out of char and getting more towards an ash scenario by the stirring, we now we scoop it up and we toss it into 55 gallon barrels. And then to, we add several other ingredients uh, to our slurry, which is now a slurry of sawdust char. Uh, we will mix in, particularly we've used humates, uh, but generally we only use those because we add extra around. Our main ingredients that we use are sea salt and molasses, both of which were uh, uh, <coughs> Fertilizers that we utilize in our regular fertilizer program, we use a lot of sea salt and we use a good amount of molasses too. So just regular agricultural sea salts and molasses, very useful fertilizers that we already utilize, use humates, we've used coffee grounds. Uh, and then we hook up the uh, irrigation pump, high pressure pump, and we got a hose line, suction line with a screen on the end of the suction line, quarter inch mesh. Uh, so and then uh, we fire up the pump. One guy stands at the, at the pump side, making sure the slurry feeds through the screen with stirring. And the other guy goes out with, a, with a, a large hose, one inch hose line, and just sprays down the acre of low tunnels with uh, a slurry of sawdust, salt, and molasses. So you're just it on top of the Right over the plastics, straight over the acre. Uh, perforating plastic? Or the solid, it's under solid plastics. And, uh, you know, obviously, once we get in, I should have mentioned that, so let me t I'll talk about that after I finish with this. And uh, that melts snow 
we got the idea from the road crews because they're piling down molasses and salt on the roads. And uh, so that's what it looks like. That melts snow so fast. Like we had one year, we had like three or four feet on top of the covers. Within like two or three days of sunlight, it was just sheer. No snow anywhere on the field, uh, completely gone. The snow didn't even leave the fields for the other producers till uh, mid-April that year. And we were in full tilt production by early February. I would say for an acre, we probably sprayed 50 pounds of sea salt and probably like 10 or 15 gallons of molasses. Now, let me get back to talking about uh, the management of the covers. So what happens is in the fall, we're still venting the covers. You, we can start off with, and we often do, just perforated, okay? And then, but often we'll get the solid on there pretty quick because we are looking for increased rate of growth generally. Okay. The perforated is gonna give you an increased rate of growth. Uh, they're, they're useful because it's like a cloth cover in that it cuts back the damage of the wind on the crop, but lets through more light than a, a cloth row cover would. So it's, it's useful and it's more useful than cloth covers for encouraging growth. Uh, but it doesn't give you the heat gain of putting a solid cover on there where you get 35 degree. When did you seed all this? Um, usually there's a stick there, but we, with spinach, we never stop seeding spinach straight through the winter time. So spinach, we start seeding as soon as we see chickweed and dead nettle germinating which uh, can be anywhere from late July to late August in our region, depending on the summer temperatures. So obviously spinach doesn't do well under uh, too hot a soil condition. Uh, if we're pushing it, what we do is we take the spinach seed and we store it in the freezer, uh, bring it out in August, seed the bed in the, in the evening and immediately irrigate it. And we'll get a better germination by introducing a frozen seed with a cool water in the evening to spark an early spinach seed germination. And then we just never stop uh, till probably our last seeding of spinach is in the beginning of May. So it's just a succession because spinach is a huge high value crop. It can be sold in salad greens. It can be sold uh, as a raw vegetable for eating. And it is a very popular winter vegetable for eating. So of winter vegetables, uh, Spinach is probably close to number one. The salad green sales are probably higher, probably, but it's very close in value to uh, salad greens and is easier to grow than a lot of the salad greens. So spinach is a huge crop for us. And so we do these successions. The earliest successions, uh, those August seeded ones and, and maybe even September ones are generally terminated uh, towards Christmas time or so, because they're kind of overgrown and get a little lanky by then. Uh, however, anything seeded in October on for spinach is uh, overwintered and will continue to produce an abundant crop growth in the spring. However, it needs to be backed up with successions in November and December, maybe January. We didn't get into them this January. It was pretty frozen solid, but we're certainly doing the more spinach seedings now. And uh, so it's pretty much a, a progression. And the thing is about low tunnel coverage and high tunnels for that matter is that the soil essentially rarely ever freezes. Uh, and so when, it, uh, when a crop is done, we, we just simply put the next crop into place. So it's a, it's a constant turnover. So if uh, you know, your fall radishes are harvested out in December, in goes the spinach. Let me talk about atmospheric management. So essentially, as I was saying, fall can start out just with a perforated cover. Then we can move into a solid cover to increase rate of growth, but we'll be venting the ends of the beds uh, often, especially you know, if it's 60, 35 degree heat gain, 95 is too hot for most of the crops. I mean, they can handle 85 if it's 50 out. You start getting into the 60s on a sunny day, we start opening covers for sure. However, what happens is as the season starts to cool and we lose light, the growth rate stops, starts halting in December and we need to vent less 
we vent for a number of reasons. It's, you vent to let out excess heat, but you also vent to interchange atmospheric uh, gases. And as the plants go dormant in December and January, there's much less need for interchange of gases. So generally, by the time we're getting heavy snows and really cold temperatures, the covers are essentially just stay put for a couple months often, unless something dramatic happens. And then now this time of year, we're starting to, you know, mid-February, early February, depending on the weather and conditions. Now we're getting back into venting the covers and letting the atmosphere exchange as the growth rate is starting to boom. So the dormant nature of the plants during those months means that we can do a lot less venting. However, once rampant growth kicks up, then we've got to start introducing atmospheric gases. And how we handle row covers is they're, they're laid out in 40-foot beds for a big reason, and that is because two people can, can throw a 40-foot cover over a bed reliably quickly. And so if we need to go into full vent, which we call, which is full removal of the plastic cover, two people on each side of a 40-foot bed can pull that plastic out, and usually they can just kind of shimmy that plastic and plop it over without ever having to walk down and pull a sandbag off the, the cover. Sometimes it'll get weird and you got to get out and you got to move one, but pretty reliably you can just snake it back and forth with the fella, dunk, toss it over. Every time the covers are always removed from the same side. So you start, the, you got your top, row, top bed here, you start in one bed down and you part the two covers like this. And that side is always removed. And so what happens is this side is always secured. And so it's the same routine. When it's time to recover that bed, you, the two people, and you, so you can just cruise right down, right? So say you're in a period where it's sunny and it's likely to be sunny more. You're gonna do want more do venting. Maybe it's got some rain coming on. Uh, you would simply, not windy, nothing threatening, you simply, but it's gonna be cold enough, you wanna protect your crop or something, you, the two people, just move down the field, pull the cover over, only secure the ends of the solid plastic so that tomorrow you can just simply unsecure it. You don't go down and put down all the bags. So depending on the time of year, there starts to be less bags securing and it gets easier and easier to work the tunnel. So it's, you paying attention to the weather, you start making it easier and easier on yourself. You know, if you're getting a windstorm and it's gonna be 20 out, you need to get back out there and put the sandbags back on the covers and keep them secure. So, and you can do half venting. You can take just the ends or even a quarter vent just up to the first bag, like right here. So this cover is only removed. I mean, say you left a perforated cover on. Uh, you could just remove the cover down to that first bag on the ends of each row and just pull them over for a little bit of air introduction, which is very easy just to go back down, put the ends back on. So it's a mixture of introducing air through various amounts by how much you remove the solid cover. Rainfall, perfect use of a perforated cover. You know, winter often has too much heavy rains. The perforated cover greatly reduces the amount of rainfall that can reach the bed surface. So you need a light rain on your winter vegetable crop. You leave the perforated cover on, you can get a little rain on it. You don't want any more moisture on your crop, leave the pop, a solid plastic over the top. So they become means of, of handling atmospheric conditions to your benefit. An over hydrated winter vegetable crop gets damaged by cold temperatures. You wanna keep them drier in, in, for the most part. Uh, the crops use two main methods to avoid uh, winter freeze injury, and that is desiccation and dryness of the leaf and saturation of the leaf with uh, sugars. So that's obviously why winter vegetables taste so delicious is because they have a high sugar content, which they're utilizing to keep them uh, cells from being frozen. Uh, the more the plant is functioning metabolically, uh, the higher the sugar content, the better it's gonna be able to re re resist freezing. Now, Let's get into time of period of cropping. So this is an example of carrots, which along with leafy greens uh, in February and March, uh, you can seed carrots in November and have them ready 
in late April or even mid-April or beginning of May, somewhere in that period. So the customers were really hungry for leafy greens starting in February and March. By April, now they're voraciously hungry for a fresh root vegetable. <laughs> and uh, then come in your, your carrots ready in fresh carrots, beautiful piles of them ready in April, uh, mid-April or you know, to early May. So those just incredible on the marketplace as well. Uh, so this gets into flowering cycles and how winter annuals grow. Essentially, most of the winter hardy vegetables we grow are winter annuals. Uh, their natural life cycle is to start their growth in the summer, form some kind of overwintering organ, whether it's a cabbage head, a root vegetable, whatever it is, that's their overwintering portion. And then that grows in the spring, bolts in the spring, forms seeds, dumps them down in the summer, and starts the whole cycle again. So it's important to conceptualize that almost all the vegetables we grow through the winter, I think pretty much all of them, there's barely a biennial out there, uh, many winter annuals are mistakenly identified as biennials. Uh, they are winter annuals. A carrot is a winter annual. It does not grow for two years. If you seed a carrot in October, it will flower in May. Okay, there's nothing biennial about a six month growth period. They are winter annuals. That is their cycle. So most of you gotta take that into consideration. Okay, all the spinach is gonna bolt in May, you know that. It might bolt in June if you seed it later, or July if you seed it later, but it's all gonna bolt. But you're not looking, you're just looking for the leaves which happen before bolting. A carrot is a different story, or an onion is a different story. They, you don't, you can't have them bolt because you're not looking for leaf harvest before bolting, you're looking for root formation, which is you know an extension of, of leaf formation. So uh, to grow winter annuals that you're looking for a different uh, uh, part of the plant than the leaf, you've got to consider the flowering cycle of the winter annual. And that means a carrot cannot reliably be seeded, uh, except for maybe very specialty varieties and things like that, uh, before, I mean, we've experimented with October, uh, but usually November, sometime in November. And then the vast majority of them will not bolt in the spring. You might get a few bolters in there, there's a few in there. Uh, you know, later gives you even less bolting, but later gives you less growth before the really cold, dark period sets in. And the same is true of onions. We do unbelievable great onion production by starting our onions in October and November. Uh, only very specific varieties. Some, in onions, the, the, the varieties are all over the place when they can uh, be seeded in terms of flowering in the spring. But I'll tell you three very reliable ones that can be seeded very early, and that is uh, the Walla Walla, uh, Bridger, and Elsa Craig. Uh, we've seeded all of those in October and had no, very little to no bolting. Many of the red onions are very bolt resistant as well. Uh, most of those go in in November. Uh, but you've got it, you know, without the information right in front of me, that's about as best as I can do for varieties off the top of my head. Uh, so, but starting the onions in a, a low tunnel like this, I wish I had a picture of it. I mean, we have thousands and thousands of onion seedlings started in October and November under these tunnels with no more management than tossing the seeds on the surface, uh, perhaps watering them in to get them started probably not because October and November are so wet anyway, covering them over and then coming back in March to, to onion seedlings that you know are as thick as my finger and this big with no effort whatsoever and then just getting them out into the field in March. Huge, beautiful onions, all winter hardy from going through winter and uh, setting them out. So onions, huge success. Uh, seed beds, we do a lot of seed beds. We'll bring cabbage through that way. Uh, kale needs to be started later, uh, but we'll do a lot of uh, leeks need to be started later in like December and things, but we do a lot of seed beds utilizing this method of the winter annual. So, but yes, carrots, you know, you need to start, if you're looking for a root vegetable, you've got to start those later in the season. Uh, beets, we've done this way. Uh, like I said, kale is prone to bolting. Collards, yep, we've done collards. They're both prone to bolting. Uh, so the kale and collards need to get started 
you know, December. Basically, you're looking at the winter solstice. So the winter solstice uh, is really the signal. Like a carrot seeded in November is going to take weeks to germinate. Uh, you know, two, three weeks. By the time it germinates, it's December. The sun is almost at its status point because uh, you know it lasts for several weeks, and it doesn't get the signal that the the sun is decreasing in day length. And instead, it's, when it comes out of the ground, it's seeing that the sun is stable and then starts to come up in the sky. And that is the, the photo period control, the day length, the angle of the sun uh, that controls so much of a winter annual vegetable gardening. Obviously, temperature can also influence it, but in general, those are, uh, that's, that's the big one, the, the light period. Uh, garlic. Uh, low tunneling garlic uh, has been incredibly effective at increasing yield in terms of weight. Uh, the garlics uh, protected under the covers in March, the garlics are huge, whereas the regular March garlics look like that. And then although at the end of the season you can't really see a huge difference in them, uh, our bulb weight, which we have reliably measured year after year, has never been less than a 20%, 25% weight gain. Most years, the weight gain approaches 50% uh, just by putting a, a low tunnel over the garlic beds. So that was really significant. Uh, and no sign of any more like fungal diseases or anything that went along with it. So we keep experimenting, we'll keep measuring. Uh, you know, obviously I could get into a lot of different winter hardy green varieties. Cilantro is incredibly winter hardy and yeah I think that pretty much covers it. I'm probably out of time here and yep yeah, I went over. So thank you everybody. Thank you. Yes.